In the 1740s, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was just another smelly music student who moved to Paris looking for his big break. It came in 1750 when he won an essay competition and became an overnight sensation with his now famous Discourse on the Sciences and Arts. He claimed the development of the arts and sciences hadn't improved the condition of humankind, but actually led to a decline in our morals. This contrarian thesis gained Rousseau instant notoriety. Throughout his life, he claimed that his whole thought was animated by one basic idea. Human beings were by nature good, but were corrupted by the influence of society. Rousseau praised nature and decried the evils of modern civilization. His writings diagnosed the growing inequalities and divisions of modern life. Although he remained deeply pessimistic about the possibility of redemption, his writings speak to how we could live more free and autonomous lives. I'm James Muldoon, I'm a lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter, and this is an introduction to Rousseau. Rousseau's life. Rousseau was born in the Republic of Geneva on 28th of June, 1712. His mother died when he was a baby, and he was brought up mainly by his father, who was a clockmaker. His father taught him a love of nature and books, and read him lots of history and classics such as Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Rousseau learnt a deep love of republics and remained proud of his home city Geneva, which was a small agricultural republic surrounded by monarchies. While other Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire tended to see monarchs as reformers who could implement their ideas, Rousseau's attachment to republican ideals meant that he always believed a republic was the best regime. He didn't enjoy being bossed around as an apprentice, so at the age of 16, after being locked outside the city walls after curfew, Rousseau decided not to return and to begin a new life for himself. During his travels, he was taken in by an older noblewoman called Madame de Warren. She lived in Annecy in the Duchy of Savoy. Over the next 10 years under her tutelage, Rousseau converted to Catholicism, continued his education in philosophy and modern literature, and even became her lover and household manager. Having grown up as a motherless child, Rousseau was much encouraged by her praise and intellectual tutelage. Despite the 14-year age gap and the fact that they had become lovers, he somewhat creepily still called her Mama. He would later marry another woman, Theresa Levasseur, who lived with him from around 1745 until his death, but he never described her with quite the same affection and devotion as dear old Mama. Rousseau developed many interests and became a polymath who composed music, plays and poetry, and wrote essays on politics, philosophy and pedagogy. In 1742 he moved to Paris and began to make his own independent way in the world. He was poor but survived off money earned from the transcription of music and private tuition. During this period Rousseau was befriended by Denis Diderot, who worked on the encyclopedia project alongside d'Alembert. This project was an attempt to collect existing human knowledge in over 28 volumes to transmit it to future generations. Rousseau was commissioned to write several articles on music and political economy for the encyclopedia. During this time, he became friends with many of the leading Enlightenment figures of Paris who saw him as an intellectual fellow traveller and an ally. The Discourse on the Sciences and Arts Rousseau was still relatively unknown, but all this would change in 1750, after he entered an essay competition held by the Academy of Dijon. The Academy invited submissions on the theme of whether the development of the arts and sciences had improved public morality. Unlike most of the other entrants, Rousseau argued that so-called advances in the arts and sciences had actually corrupted people and denigrated morality. The essay put forward one of Rousseau's fundamental ideas that human beings were by nature good and became corrupted through the influence of society. Unlike many of his peers, Rousseau preferred Sparta to Athens because he thought the culture and artistic achievements of the Athenians were ultimately corrupting of their society. It was unusual for a man like Rousseau to be so critical of Athens, which for many Enlightenment thinkers of the 18th century was the pinnacle of artistic and literary achievement. He also argued that advances in the sciences created a false sense of need for luxury, which might make our lives easier and more pleasurable, but didn't make us better people. Even by 1750, Rousseau had already showed signs that he would be an extraordinarily influential but controversial figure. He's perhaps the most important political writer of the 18th century because his work embodies so many of the ambiguities and contradictions of this epoch of change. 
Modern philosophy was animated by the question of the power and limits of human reason to transform society into a more free and equal social order. Rousseau is a key Enlightenment thinker because he championed human reason and humanity's perfectibility through moral and cultural development. But at the same time, he is the principal source of inspiration for the counter-Enlightenment and Romantic movements. He criticised the corrupting effects of modern society and drew from art, nature, imagination and sensibility. He is also a transitional figure between early and late modern writers. His political writings are a synthesis of the classical republican tradition of active citizenship and civic virtue, and the modern rights-based discourse of Hobbes and Locke. He both looks forward to the way that modern political economy and capitalism will transform society, but he also looks back to an older agrarian republicanism that was already in the process of being replaced by larger, more complex and divided commercial societies. He was a very pragmatic thinker in many ways, but the vision he put forward of politics in his most famous political work, The Social Contract, draws a lot from a utopian vision of small-scale republicanism practiced in Swiss villages like his native Geneva. He was one of the most influential philosophers of the time, but also saw philosophy primarily in a negative light. For him it was a rationalisation of injustice and inequality, and a way of alienating modern individuals from their natural impulses to compassion. His temperament also made him an extremely controversial figure, because he was very earnest, sensitive and sincere, and was often disgusted by the lives of those around him. He hated the life of a famous author in Paris, and preferred to live alone. He wrote a successful opera called The Village Soothsayer, which was performed in Paris, and brought him even more fame and attention. But in spite of this, Rousseau kept living a modest life, and he even refused a lifelong pension offered by the king. But as his success grew, his unorthodox views began to put a strain on his relationships with his friends in Paris like Diderot and D'Alembert. To some Enlightenment thinkers, Rousseau's condemnation of the arts and sciences placed him in the camp of the enemies of progress and reason. If the first essay cast doubts on whether Rousseau could be counted as an intellectual ally, a second essay he drafted in response to another essay competition only made things worse. Discourse on Inequality Although his Discourse on the Origins and Basis of Inequality Among Men, published in 1755, didn't win the prize, he considered this, with good reason, a better developed and far deeper attack on modern society than his first essay. In his second essay, Rousseau provided a conjectural history of the origins of human society from a natural condition. He imagined what it might be like living in a state of nature, as a way of questioning the extent to which inequalities were natural or a result of human decisions. His answer was one of the most radical critiques of modern society of the time, and anticipated certain aspects of Marx's critique of capitalism. Rousseau argued that the development of modern institutions like law, property and the state actually created and strengthened forms of class rule which were basically inexistent in a more natural condition. Law gave the rich an instrument with which they could oppress the poor and justify inequalities which were completely arbitrary from the point of view of nature. From this point on, what was initially won through force and domination was then justified as part of a just society, which was purportedly to the benefit of all. The true founder of civil society was the first man who, having enclosed a piece of land, thought of saying, this is mine, and came across people simple enough to believe him. It's a scathing attack on modern society because it calls into question the entire social order, and sees current wealth inequalities as ultimately based in force and fraud. It also allowed Rousseau to further develop his idea of the innate goodness of human beings and the corrupting influence of civilization. Alongside the instinctual drive towards self-preservation, Rousseau thought that we had an equally important drive to help others. He argued that we have a natural moral quality of compassion, pite in French, which precedes any rational thought processes or social influence. When we see people suffering, our natural instinct is to rush to their aid. It's only after living in social institutions that we're taught to turn our back on the suffering of others and justify their position as somehow their fault. This essay is really important if you're reading The Social Contract, because in many ways The Social Contract can be read as a possible answer to the many problems raised in this discourse. It's unclear what, if anything, is the positive program of the discourse, or how Rousseau proposed to rectify the many problems he diagnosed in modern societies. 
Some readers thought that he advocated a primitivism and that we should completely reject modern society. In 1756, Rousseau left Paris with his wife and began a period of travel on account of his personal feuds and his political persecution. This period would be the most productive of his life as he published a number of important works. First were Julie or The New Eloise, which was one of the best-selling novels of the 18th century. Second, his political work The Social Contract. And finally, a book called Emile, which was a discourse on education. The Social Contract and Emile. The Social Contract and Emile can be seen as two examples of his mature political writings, in which he put forward arguments about how we can live as free and equal citizens in modern societies. In The Social Contract, Rousseau theorised the political institutions a republic would need to guarantee a new kind of civil and moral freedom for equal citizens. He sought to answer the question of how people could come together to form a society and create a legitimate government that would secure and enhance their mutual freedom. He followed Hobbes and Locke in proposing a social contract in which people renounce some of their rights to create an artificial body called a sovereign. But unlike these writers, Rousseau thought that every citizen should actively participate in legislative activity. He argued that people could give up their natural freedom to receive a superior form of civil and moral freedom, where their rights would be protected and they could follow the laws knowing they'll prescribe rational and virtuous action. What man loses by the social contract is his natural liberty and an unlimited right to everything he tries to get and succeeds in getting. What he gains is civil liberty and the proprietorship of all he possesses. He also suggested that sovereignty would be expressed in the general will, a term which Rousseau used to refer to a procedure of determining the common good through democratic deliberation and decision making. His notion of the general will contains certain ambiguities which we'll examine in the next video on the social contract. In his other text, Emile, Rousseau proposed a form of educating children that centred on developing a child's natural capacities through a process of discovery and learning autonomy. Rather than following a prescribed curriculum with a stern authority figure, Rousseau favoured seeing a child developing autonomy and following a more independent path of learning. Following his idea of the innate goodness of human beings, he thought that education should develop a child's curiosity and protect it from the dominating influence of others. He preferred practical experiences rather than formal lessons from books. He also thought that a child should have their natural inclinations towards compassion for others nurtured. The final stage of development would involve the child's tutor becoming a trusted equal and advisor, and the child going out into a new environment as an autonomous adult. There are some weird aspects of his model, such as the child being locked away from the outside world for most of its life, and having all of its encounters controlled by their tutor. But there's a lot of good advice in there as well. All of this very admirable sounding theory of education stands in stark contrast to Rousseau's actual parenting. He fathered five children with his wife and abandoned them all. Far from the nurturing parenting advised in Emile, all of his children were left to the very perilous future of life at an 18th century French orphanage. These two texts offer an interesting snapshot of Rousseau's mature thought, but they were both condemned in Geneva and Paris largely on account of their religious views. Rousseau was a Christian but advocated for a civic religion along the lines of Machiavelli as a form of civic activity that would increase the bonds of solidarity between citizens. This pleased neither the Christian authorities or the largely atheist and materialist enlightenment thinkers, who both had good reason to dislike Rousseau's position. He was under a lot of pressure from his work being banned and burnt in different countries across Europe. He became more paranoid and convinced that many of his former friends were now engaged in a plot against him. Over the next years, he moved from France to Switzerland to Berlin, Paris, and finally to England in 1764. But after falling out with David Hume, he sailed back to live incognito in the southeast of France. He began to write autobiographical texts, and in one of his final works entitled Confessions, he attempted to give an account of and apologise for certain things he had done while at the same time justifying himself to the public. It was one of the first modern autobiographies that gave an account of his personal experiences rather than a story of his great works and deeds. His critics see in this work a full-blown paranoia, while others see this as one of his finest writings and a model for future pieces in the genre. Rousseau's Legacy 
Rousseau was an incredibly influential figure in philosophy, politics, literature, and education. He occupies a unique position as both an exemplar of certain aspects of Enlightenment philosophy, but also as one of the leading forerunners to Romanticism. His name is synonymous with the idea of the natural goodness of humans and the corrupting influence of civilization. He was recognized as the most eloquent writer of his age, and even his bitter enemies acknowledge his literary brilliance. He was also an incredible polymath, and extraordinary versatile in his abilities. He is perhaps most infamous for inspiring the leaders of the French Revolution, including Robespierre. He was also the first major Republican thinker of the 18th century, and influenced the modern Republican tradition which continued with thinkers such as James Harrington, James Madison, and Immanuel Kant. Rousseau was particularly influential over Kant's ethics and his conception of the moral law as a universalizable rule which provides autonomy. Rousseau's novel, Julie or the New Eloise, impacted the late 18th century's romantic naturalism movement, and his novel, Emile, inspired later theories of pedagogy. His book, The Social Contract, continues to attract great attention, especially on the question of whether it promotes radical egalitarianism or whether it unwittingly glorifies the totalitarian rule of the collective over individuals. Because of the ambiguities of his work, his ideas have been developed in a number of divergent ways. For a closer look at his text, The Social Contract, you can see my next video, and please subscribe for more political philosophy.